Death is difficult, but inevitable. That's why we want to remind you that it doesn't have to be so scary. Our mission is to educate, center, and intrigue you while making tasteful humor along the way. Welcome to another episode of Home is Where the Grave is. We are your host, Dulce. And I'm Unity. Join us in our journey to educate, intrigue, and center ourselves on the subject of death and what comes after. Hello. So, hello. 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 <laughs> so, hello to you, Dulce, and hello to you, still living listeners. Welcome to another episode of Home is Where the Grave is. Um, what all has been going on this week besides the Titanic having a part two? Yeah, I think that's pretty much taken the internet by storm. <laughs> and didn't they already come out with a documentary? I think they did a few years ago. It's, no, the one that just happened. No, it just yes. happened. How yes, they, they already have a documentary. It probably came out on Thursday. No. And we didn't even know if they were dead yet, and they already had a documentary out. Wow. So let's just preface this that it was a um it was a very tragic and large loss of life. It was unnecessarily and I think that's why it's getting so much flack right now because there were so many warning signs, there were so many faulty issues with this equipment and the guy that was heading this entire thing up did not want to hear it because he knew better than all the experts. And this has been a fascinating uh, study on billionaires versus everybody else uh, how the internet uh, largely reacts to billionaires dying in unfortunate if somewhat stupid circumstances uh, the immediate um, roasting that they were of a man who was already dead and how little pity anyone really felt for a father, his 19-year-old son, a Titanic expert, a famous adventurer, and the CEO who created the sub, albeit very, very poorly done. So, absolutely fascinating. I think this is something that we'll be like referring to for many, many years. Also, this is probably going to be more the most morbidly funniest thing that's ever happened in our lifetime if that's even the correct way to say it it's like something that we, you would read on an onion article or a comedy movie not real life exactly. so it's true what they say <laughs> life is stranger than fiction it really is it never really in is. a million years would i have believed you if you told me that there was this poorly constructed submarine made out of metal that was past its time from an created from an airplane created by a man who very obviously broke rules and failed to listen to experts and then charged people two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to go visit the wreck of the titanic and then they would die just like the wreck of the titanic Hundred years irony, ago, the the heavily heavily coded irony of this entire situation is not lost on anyone, and that's what's taking it by storm. <laughs> it's 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 what yeah, like you could not have crafted a more ironic situation, and unfortunately, this extremely ironic situation that would be go well in the script happened in real life and ended with the death of five people yep on a lighter note your bird is having a sing-along fest in the background <laughs> we've been joking that every time he sings a tequila song we have to take a shot um obviously we can't because we would die because that's his favorite song yep yep Enjoy the song of his people. That's right. Meaning the Mexican family that raised him. <laughs> 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 
da, 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 da. <laughs> Tequila. How could you tell he used to belong to a family Mexican? <laughs> a family Mexican. <laughs> Oh my gosh. But yeah, and that's been the news week. Uh, amongst other things, that's just one of the. Didn't think we would have Titanic 1.5 happening. 2.0. In summary. <laughs> I don't even know if I count it as a two, as a second Titanic because of just the circumstances. I don't know. I just it's don't the even same count circumstances. <laughs> Except this time, no poor people could afford to be on it. The Titanic, you know, it was like a lot of rich people and the poor people. This time it was just all rich people. Let this be a lesson, kids. Stop repeating history. <laughs> you do Read history better. so that you don't repeat history. Oh, that's right. We have an age restriction. Adults. <laughs> Find your inner child and teach them. <laughs> Stop thinking that you're better, you know better than experts historians and literal Absolutely. scientists and architects or whatever engineers, engineers. sorry yeah <laughs> so anyways here's to um if i win the lottery i would retire both of us i appreciate that i would do the same if i ever played the lottery oh <laughs> then play with it play it with me otherwise we're going to be working until we're dead we may not live that long. <laughs> on to today's topic on that hey. note. <laughs> you want to introduce it? Yes. So today's topic is anxiety, childhood morbidity, and horror vaccination. Basically, what creates spicy horror-driven chicks like us? Give you a like hint. You. I think it's you definitely started in childhood. <laughs> a lot of it did. A lot of it definitely started out in, um, you know, I mean, it's funny too because we all have different types of traumas and they, they range and they vary across a spectrum of different issues. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. Don't ask me to explain this better to you. <laughs> um, but it, it all varies, right? And everything mm -hmm. in life is anxiety inducing and we all have our special doses and experiences that give us that that special spice, you know, from the um Powerpuff Girls. What was it? Sugar spice and everything nice? Yes, and then it created some extremely violent girls. So <laughs> that no was, one thought about that. I know, that was the lesson from that whole show. So, we're going to get into our <laughs> Are you having a moment there? You're like, I need to, I need to absorb this. <laughs> when they were in kindergarten. And extremely violent. Wow, were they really in kindergarten? Yes. Wow. <laughs> okay, anyway. We're not going to take this entire episode up for that. <laughs> so, yes, we're basically going to be... Um, Talking about why we think childhood anxiety um, is very likely to lead to an adult fascination and attraction to horror. Um, and which is very convenient because I think we are entering a golden age of horror films, which makes life worth living uh, for people like me. Um, <laughs> or on another way to phrase it is why is horror so calming? Like, why has it become a safe space for so many people? Like, I will admit, I like to chill and watch horror films. Mm -hmm. The more violent and graphic, the better. I love having it over a cup of coffee. And I'm just, like, chilling and enjoying my free time and watching somebody being viciously murdered on TV. That's, like, my definition of a, a nice, relaxing evening. And you know what's amazing about that is that your sentiment is shared with a lot of people. Like there are so many people that I was just browsing on the internet and there, there isn't just one full study. We'll talk about several different studies that were done, but they go on a range of different aspects of the human nature that are attracted to horror, but they don't quite preface enough 
that aspect that you just said, that it, there's a sense of catharsis for you, sense of comfort and calming. But everybody on the internet shares that sentiment is like, yeah, it calms me. Yeah, I'm also very calm with this. And it's not that we're emo or very violent people or secretly serial killers or <laughs> like to torture animals. No, none of that. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Is that going to be your uh, your alibi? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't hear a fly. I did kill five flies before this video started. But <laughs> I remember hearing you. <laughs> you like, die, die, die. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will viciously murder mosquitoes, flies, ticks. Yes. Yes. Everything else is safe around me. Currently, we're uh, experiencing an uh, epidemic with gnats. Yes. It's very relaxing to um, fry them with my electric fly sweater. I can vouch for that. I have played with that thing. It is pretty. <laughs> and then I feed them to my ants. Oh, yeah. How's your ant farm doing? It's good. It's eating all the ants. I mean, the gnats. <laughs> Both. You know, whatever. They're eating each they other. They will ants. grab... The fly and then like beat it like tumble it around kind of like how a crocodile grabs onto your arm and starts turning so yeah. they can like snap it off that's kind of what they do it's fascinating to watch so that brings up a really interesting difference between us <laughs> 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 so we have two different types here right obviously mm -hmm. For like you and I, we have experienced different traumas in our own way that have mm -hmm. severely caused um, anxiety. Mm -hmm. We have what I would, I, this is not self-diagnosing, but I think you have been diagnosed, right? Social anxiety? Yep. Or more like they called it chronic stress. Chronic stress. Okay. So I have not been diagnosed like you have. So this is very much a personal opinion um, of I know I align with the symptoms of stress. I know my I know for a fact my cortisol levels are through the roof uh, on a consistent basis. And that's that comes from fight or flight from stress. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think I fall in line with what they call high functioning anxiety. So I can cover it up more so i look on the surface very calm but inside it is a mess <laughs> but anyway I, that is I, I love talking about this stuff with a smile on my face right <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because you and i both have things in our life that has caused chronic stress chronic anxiety in different mm -hmm. in different ways but our approach to horror or slasher films are very different. Yours is comfort where mine is like, I don't like the anticipation. So mm -hmm. it makes it worse for me. So slasher horror, all of the anticipation that comes with all of it stresses me out more. <laughs> oh, yeah. See, I don't understand that. See, and I, didn't I love blood you. and violence. <laughs> And I didn't understand you until I started doing the, the research on this one. And I was like, okay, I mean, I don't necessarily understand it, but I can kind of empathize where you guys come from with that. And I'm like, okay, all right. I, I hear you. Don't feel the same, but I hear you. But, you know, Hollywood has really not uh, missed the beat on this one. They, even though studies have only... I think for the longest time, studies have been like, oh, well, people are adrenaline junkies, and that's why they love horror films, and it's such a big deal. Well, it doesn't quite cover all the basis for everybody, and mm -hmm. it's such a, a wide net of people. Mm -hmm. But Hollywood's true, been true, like, true. you know what? This is a moneymaker. We're jumping on this, and they've done well. Mm -hmm. Actually, they've taken their time mm. make good films. The indie market is killing it right now. You know, with like Midsummer, Hereditary, Smile, like all fantastic films. Now they're starting to bring back oldies and remaking them and actually making them amazing, like The Evil Dead. 
freaking love it. Oh, no, that was a horrifying movie. Yeah. That was a horrifying... Oh, love it. That was amazing. Um, and then, yeah, I've seen, like, just about every horror movie that's come out, I've been to theaters to see it. It's amazing. Um, and then horror video games have become really popular again. Uh, you know, Finance of Freddy's took the whole world by storm. Like, you won't believe how many kids I see carrying around uh, Finance for Freddy's plushies, even in foreign countries. Mm -hmm. uh, my cousin visiting from Mexico specifically had to find a Five Nights for Freddy's plushie for his 10-year-old son in Mexico. Uh, <laughs> then you, there's that... Um, there's a lot of video games centered around childhood from the 90s. If you've noticed that. Which is like, that's the gist of Finance of Freddy's, but it's not the only one now, and it's not the only popular one. And it's absolutely fascinating. Like, it's a, our childhood makes us both nostalgic, but also frightens us at the same time. Yep. And it is something that we're going to delve into a little bit more. Uh, so... To start off, some things that we know about anxiety, right? So it refers to, to the anticipation of a future concern that is more associated with muscle tension and avoidance behavior. Fear is an emotional response to an immediate threat and is more associated with a fight or flight reaction, either staying to fight or leaving to escape danger, according to the American Psychiatric Association. So we mentioned uh, chronic anxiety before, mm -hmm. and for people that actually are smart and believe in mental -ish health issues, it's a real thing. It's like, uh, it's like any other health issues, you know? It's like having diabetes. You can't ignore it, and you have to uh, get it taken care of, and more than likely continues continuous care. Like, diabetes isn't just going to disappear because you took a pill, you know? Absolutely. So, because, and so on that note, chronic anxiety can affect every aspect of your life and provides little to no release. It's like, builds like a pressure cooker, which is why they tell you, don't, you know, should tell you not to uh, hold stuff in, you know, like feelings, emotions, traumatic events, like from childhood, because they will come back and will lead to mental health issues later on it's kind of like a given like it's it's gonna build up if it's still bothering you it's bothering you for, for a reason you know oh absolutely that's <clears throat> i think the older i've gotten the more i realize what is it the, the grief the acceptance program where mm -hmm. they're like um acceptance is the first step whatever program it's a part of i know they're like oh no acknowledgement acknowledgement is the first step because the more you deny it, your subconscious is not denying it. It still lives there. It exists. And you will find ways to act out either inappropriately or toxically because you're avoiding the issue that is causing issues within you because you're not dealing with it. <laughs> yes. And so I, you mentioned inappropriately. And we're not talking about like you sub subconscious, uh, consciously doing it, but subconsciously doing it. Yep. Like you can't stop talking, you know? Like you go hang out with somebody and you like just will not stop talking about stuff that's been bothering you or your family, even if you're like cognizant and be like, why am I telling this person all this stuff? Like it's just like stuff that you can't control. Um, some people will develop mannerisms, you know, like biting nails and all that. It's subconscious, like you're not conscious that you're doing it until you somebody either points it out or you finally notice it. Yep. Um, trichotillomania is another one. People that pull their hair out. Yeah. A lot of it is because of anxiety, chronic anxiety. Um, so yeah, all that stuff can come up because you like push things down, and it just blows up later. Um, so there is a, um, there's a chokehold of irrational fear of endless possibilities that hold many threats to our lives and the afterlife that we can't control. What do you think that means? So for that is like, there is a general, I know we, in, 
in this podcast, we talk a lot about death, right? Mm -hmm. And the acceptance of death and the idea of death. There is a chronic fear about death because one of the things that you're afraid of is that you don't know what comes after. You have no control. You have no way of preparing for that. But also we still live, we still exist. So we have a chronic fear of the day-to-day life that we don't know what's coming. We don't know the future. We don't know how to prepare for that. There's no semblance of real control, especially in a society where things are so turbulent all the time. Yeah, when I was a kid, I thought everything was out to kill me. Yeah. (laughs) Some of us, it was very literal. It was like, I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow. Maybe like at five years old, I'm like, man, am I going to make it past 10 years old? (laughs) That's why I say all the time, I'm like, you know, I really didn't think I was going to be here. I didn't think I was going to get this far. I'm really There's confused. been a couple of close calls, don't get me wrong. I'm surprised. In any other world, somebody probably would have died in the same situation I was in. I hear you. I hear you. And, uh, so, like, a lot of this behavior does start in childhood, which is why we're talking about it today. And... Uh, through traumas and that vary in severity for each individual. So Unity introduces to the next part. So kind of going off of that, right? Um, so the concept of death, we're going to go into a little bit. Um, and we were saying how it's no different than the fear of the day-to-day life because the concept of death is the annihilation of oneself, um, it's a radical transformation. It's a threat to the meaningfulness of life. And it's a threat to the completion of life projects. Like, oh, regrets. I didn't get to do the X, Y, and Z. All of this is to say that a person riddled with anxiety experiences little to no reprieve from this constant adrenaline release buildup. Like that, like you said, that pressure cooker. So that anticipation and the dread of the unknown are never validated. And therefore, it gives no sense of control. Hmm. Um, And like you said, you've got childhood. Oh, to um, to transition to what you were saying. So the effects that come from chronic anxiety, especially in childhood, a lot of people have questioned. Does it contribute to childhood morbidity, meaning Mm -hmm. childhood death? Right. Um. So there was a small study that was done on it. And what it says and kind of explains is that uh, childhood morbidity refers to the incidence of illness or disease in children caused by chronic anxiety. Can be caused by chronic anxiety. Yep. So while anxiety can affect individuals of all ages, including children, it is important to note that anxiety itself is not the cause of childhood morbidity alone. However, anxiety can have an impact on a child's well-being and potentially contribute to certain health issues indirectly. So some of those things are to say, um, like your physical health, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It can have excessive anxiety and stress can manifest physically, leading to symptoms such as chronic headaches, stomach aches, fatigue, muscle tension. All of this eventually also disrupts your internal organs and your metabolic system as well which goes into the impact of your immune system and guess what overall your mental health so your ability to cope and interact in social environments Hmm. and come a lot of this could be brought on by like abuse in the household or neglect a lot of the times with this especially childhood abuse and neglect it's not just one instance it's chronic Mm -hmm. so it's compacted And because children were not given the opportunity to be able to grow up like normal children, like the average healthy child. Or have a stable period. Because that's kind of the point of childhood is that you needed, you need that stable period in your life to prepare you to be an independent adult later on. And by stability, we mean like a place that is full of love, welcoming, 
that you're not gonna be thrown out because you don't get accepted you know like that you don't have to worry about of uh, the basics that you need like food water clothing uh it's just just a space where you are accepted by somebody who values you and wants to um that somebody that is that treats you like a child and wants you to be a have a happy childhood basically it's just it's just a stability it's just it's really necessary if i've learned anything growing up it's like it's so important for everybody to have just that period of stability because you really need that in order to prepare you for adulthood and just like and with that stability is obviously the ability to uh explore your own environment in a safe manner you know like relationships games uh adventures responsibilities it's in a manner that is safe and is being overseen hopefully by a parent guardian to make sure that you will not be negatively impacted more so, or uh, more so that you will be uh, able to take this as a learning opportunity absolutely i agree with that and that's one of the things that um even though a lot of kids don't receive that treatment and it, it all depends on the individual the circumstances there's so many different factors right it's not to say that somebody that experiences this chronic stress chronic anxiety chronic mistreatment that they can't be functioning adults they can um, they may need additional help they may need treatment um, or they may not they may be fully functioning themselves but eventually at some point some type of intervention is helpful to become a more successful healthy adult for themselves and everybody around them but well when you don't get that stability you're going to be missing those key factors the, that you will need later on which could end up causing you to delay mm -hmm. like your like maturity you know, adulthood. On, on that you point, know? there's a lot of kids, myself included, that were told growing up, like, especially by adults, they're like, oh, you're so mature for your age. You're so mature. And it's funny because now it's coming out in droves where people are like, I was told that too, but it's coming to the point where we're realizing we weren't mature for our age. We had to grow up faster in certain aspects, but that severely stunted us in different aspects. So now that we're an adult, now that we've caught up with how we were acting that whole time, now we see all the deficiencies of what we had. So it wasn't that you had that you were mature, is that you had learned how that this specific world operated and you had learned how to function in that world. So to make somebody happy enough so that you would not be negatively impacted. So obviously 100%. that stunted you for the real world. Like, uh, yeah, obviously if you weren't given the space to actually develop meaningful relationships, then you were going to struggle to actually interact with anyone outside of your immediate household. Like, yep. you know, college, co-workers, bosses, and you would have no way to know what is uh, like a good relationship, professional relationships, like what is bad what is abusive you now like that's all that is important to learn and you you're supposed to learn that in childhood yep <laughs> but all that to say and that's all really good conversation it's it's deep conversation it's impactful and i know a lot of people experience that so it's very shared um but all that is to go into like coping mechanisms and the coping mechanism that we're talking about is what we know about horror and how that relates you want to go for it aka how we escape from the weird world by watching someone else suffer <laughs> so horror is a form of safety net it like allows uh, uh, so the way I would word it, it'd be, it allows you to be able to experience that fight or flight, uh, those fight or flight feelings in a controlled environment, you know, without any immediate danger. 
It also provides a personal pressure release from real life and validates real emotions like anxiety. Uh, I would also argue what I love about horror movies is, you know, especially most horror movies are about like ghosts, you know, or demons or, you know, nothing in the real world. So what's, what are, what are you worried about in the real world that can actually murder you? People, scary men, your neighbors. And, and so, like, I love watching horror movies because they're not based on real life most of the time, you know? I don't have to worry about the demon coming out of my mirror and stealing me into another world and using, or, no, mirror is the one where, like, it, like, forces you to murder yourself, kill yourself, murder yourself, unalive yourself. <laughs> And um, so horror can give form to the unknown that lives in our imaginations or deep in our emotions. The unknown that exists in society, life, and death. AKA, it's like a su- I I love it because it's such a creative way to explore why something causes you fear. Because mm. I would argue that's like the whole basis of the horror genre. Because obviously you're not going to make be making a horror movie about something that people aren't scared of. True. Then you have to figure it out. Why does this scare somebody? And the successful film is something that scares a lot of people. So there are several psychological reasons people may, uh, that people may like horror movies. Uh, so it's thrill and excitement uh, for like a thrill-seeking adrenaline junkies, to put it crudely. Uh, I would argue that's actually true because I am deathly horrified of roller coasters. So mm. horror movies is a my version of adrenaline. Horror movies and haunted houses. There's also a sense of bonding with others through a shared experience of anticipation, fear, jump scares, and laughter. Um, you know, like there's something so fun about watching a horror movie with your friends because the whole point of watching it is because you want to s- try to scare the shit out of your friends as well. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you get scared together and you laugh about it and it's you guys went through it together. So <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, me and my cousins in Mexico, we loved watching horror movies and we would always do it out in the middle of nowhere outside of town. At this place we called Las Albercas, meaning the pools. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so it's abandoned. There's nobody out there but us. Because we're completely surrounded by, like, nobody. There's just a road and lots of empty, empty space, yards of just grass and trees and stuff. There's no one out there, right? Right. So we would get in this room and watch some, like, absolutely horrifying, um, typically, like, Japanese movies. And there's always that one some of bitch who like because there was a secret corridor right behind where we were viewing the movies, and never failed. Somebody was freaking hiding in there when scare that crap out of us. <laughs> that was horrible. And then um, horrible back then. Now it's just like hilarious. And then at some point that evolved into the place was actually haunted, and then people claiming that they saw ghosts. And there did happen to be a abandoned hotel right next to where we were at. And so it just sparked all sorts of like imagin- imaginations and like um, that just spread from one to another. And so we don't even know if like it was because of the movies, if the ghosts had always been there or if we just let our imaginations go free, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But it was just us kids all by ourselves, created the perfect scenario to watch horror movies and scare ourselves silly. That's perfect. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> But, you know, it kind of <laughs> leads into a beautiful segue with that. Um, with, what is it, uh, Dr. Matthias Clayson? Mm-hmm. He is kind of obsessed with studying people who love slashers and horror films. Mm-hmm. And he did his recent study um which just to give you some of the categories that are i think is kind of interesting he did his study based off of um age and horror consumption right so he found out that younger people are obviously the ones that like if it comes between you or your granny it's probably gonna be 
you know, the younger 20s, teens, 20s and 30s that Mm -hmm. really enjoy horror. Um, He even did it based off of like education. He did it off of gender, which according to them, they said that men enjoy horror more than women. Lies. I know. That's what I was like. (laughs) I feel like maybe back in the day that would have been the case, but I I don't know. You haven't you haven't met women today, I, but he literally did this study in 2020, so that's why I'm like, okay, all right. Mm. I don't think mm. you found enough of the weird ones, but all right. <laughs> we'll do um, our own study since we're going to that convention. Yeah, that's and all true. I see is like a bunch of women, the ones that are making this really creepy art and stuff exactly so i'm like i don't think you got enough of the women that enjoy horror my dude Mm -hmm. but another interesting aspect that he studied on he claims that there is a sense of paranormal belief so for those who believe more in the paranormal are more drawn to like watching horror films based on like supernatural stuff so i was like hmm so it's like the deeper, even if you're a skeptic, even with, there's a double edge or there's like a double side to this coin. If you are a skeptic of supernatural, more than likely you also believe in it. And I was like, interesting theory, but okay. I don't, but. <laughs> or do so you? It's, that's interesting to me because my mom wouldn't allow me to watch horror movies because she literally thought a demon was going to come out. With the movie, you know, it came with the DVD. Oh, yeah, I remember this. Just like, a, <laughs> just like a, we weren't allowed to watch Harry Potter because they was uh, filled with witches. So, like, it just this. like it was just included. It was included in the book and the DVD. <laughs> Don't worry, Complete my with the demon. <laughs> my mom's so funny because she went from. Uh, being okay with horror film, you just had to cover your ears whenever they did any sort of chanting. Uh-huh. But like straight up, you're bringing a demon into my house every time you watch a horror movie. And I think I remember one time she like went around the room spraying like holy water because we were watching a horror film. There's been plenty of times your mom has sprayed holy water in the room, on people, at people. <laughs> on that note though she would never watch a horror movie because she actually believes in it but mm. I don't which is the whole appeal to me that like I don't believe in ghosts prove me wrong universe I don't believe in them sometimes I'm it's inviting a you and sometimes it's a danger to you <laughs> I'm not afraid I am afraid of no ghosts I'm afraid for you <laughs> you're gonna be afraid for both of us I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so horror movies. Uh, so somebody argued that it's teaching us about ourselves, like a mirror being reflected back, uh, a mirror into our demons, uh, self-reflection, introspection. By confronting these monsters on screen, we can gain insight into our own struggles, fears, and vulnerabilities. So that's kind of like what I was talking about before is like, why does something scare you? Right? So let's talk about some of the classics. And, and, and if you haven't noticed, horror movies are very political. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. So think about it. And I mean, if you think I'm wrong, you can say something. But we At let's us. go back to um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, right? The setting is... A town in the middle of nowhere, completely abandoned by society. It has no um, social services. It has it's being just completely disconnected. And so that's kind of like what the movie's trying to say. Like, what happens to a, a people when they're completely disconnected from society mm. and they're like been purposely neglected by the government? Like, there's not making sure they like there's no when the government's supposed to be there to assure you basics of survival you know like water electricity welfare education and in texas chainsaw massacre there's none of that and so therefore leading to this creation of this horrifying monster that turns out he's not even the biggest monster in the movie it's all of the people in town 
And the only innocents are the children who have yet to be infected by by the cult by the culture that this town has created for itself. I am still determined that while horror movies and slashers create some fantastic monsters, the scariest monster is always humans. Mm-hmm. Every time. True. Hmm. And then um I'm into some of my other favorite films really quick. My favorites are The Grudge and The Ring, right? And those two movies are very directly created because of the Japanese sphere of technology. Mm. So if you didn't know anything about Japanese culture, you know, they believe that uh, images would capture your soul or a piece of your soul, which is why there's a, ga- a game called um, Fiddle Frame. I and therefore, that that's why the the ring was invented it's literally a vhs tape that she recorded and it's meant to kill everybody who watches it in seven days right yep um well uh, and then obviously the grudge is a little different uh and it's absolutely fascinating uh because for us westerners if you haven't noticed our movies tend to revolve around demons you know, it goes for the straightforward demons and Christian mythology, basically. But the grudge, it kind of stands alone. It ha- like it is based on some Japanese folklore, but the idea that somebody can die in such a horrible way that they can continue to infect the world around them, you know, absolutely fascinating. And yes, like you said, I kind of like. That's an example where the biggest monsters were the humans to begin with. You know, the, the her husband that murdered her and her son. And then it's kind of like all these innocent people that end up being affected by it. And isn't that kind of how the real world works? You know? Yep. Somebody commits an unspeakable crime and it's kind of like the ripple waves of what happens afterward. It really does represent real life in so many different ways. There's um, there was a really good TED talk that I'll I'll link the, you know the link to in the show notes. But it's a great this guy starts talking about you know his relationship to horror movies, and like you said, he he also said how it relates to political and current events. But his main stance on it was how horror movies taught him empathy now you would not think this of all things Hmm. of all shows of all genres horror would teach someone empathy like that is not the first thing that comes to my mind so for him to be like and he methodically goes through every single and it's it's very heartfelt it it makes you really feel for him because he he's been bullied his whole life like and he even came up he had a hard home life it was just everything so he's like Mm -hmm. you know in horror films, you honestly have to be able to put yourself in those person's shoes. Not only the, the victims, but also the monsters. And the way that the producer sets up that film, you feel for both sides. True. So I thought that was pretty interesting, too. That's interesting. Hmm. And then let's like... Right, so let's think of some, like, modern examples of this, right? Mm. So the first thing that would pop into mind is Hereditary, right? The movie? Have you seen Hereditary? Yeah. No, I haven't. Okay, well, it is on, like, arguably one of the most horrifying movies in, like, the last couple decades. Mm-hmm. Um, so, the bad guys in this film... It isn't really quite clear because the overall message is how mental illness can impact generations in one family. Yes. And that's like the point of the movie, how like it's no really escaping it. Because it's it just it just goes from one generation to the next to the next. It gets carried on. Uh for people that didn't know, generational trauma is a thing. It's not necessarily that it's in your genetics to be traumatized. 
It's more so the lasting impact of a traumatic uh, effect on one of your ancestors. Like, for example, I would say, like in Mexico, the turn of the 1900s, there was the Mexican Revolution and the Cristiada, where there was people getting murdered left and right, right? So what are the lasting impacts of people that have had to learn how to survive, how to defend themselves, how to hide, how to look for warning signs, how to know when uh, something bad's about to happen? And then they'll teach that the next generation and then for like my family uh i would say that's probably why we don't have any re like items that we carry from one family to another because if you're always on the run how are you gonna keep things with you you know yeah that's crazy and it it that is shared amongst different cultures and different ethnicities um mm -hmm. i know it's more commonly heard with um with black people for their generational trauma. And it's a very real thing mm -hmm. that is still very current for them. Um, but it's interesting to hear it from like other cultures like Mexico. And that's, mm -hmm. so that's really interesting to hear that too. Cause like for uh, my, Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to mention another example, but mm. uh, smile. If that's a, that's a recent movie. Another one about uh, mental health. Uh, and that's fascinating because that is a it is a the monster is passed on from from trauma to trauma so it depends it it strongly depends on this person causing trauma to another person so that it can jump onto the next person and it needs to continue that way and that that is a great example because that is a it is a monster it is a whatever you want to call it that is jumping from one person to the next hello birdie <laughs> uh but that is such a good physical representation of something metaphysical something that you cannot see but it does get passed to the next person to the next person to the next exactly that's why I love horror films. So on that note, um, how does horror help some of our anxiety? We've, I feel like we've hit on a lot of this, um, on how it's relatable, but let, let's deep dig in a little bit deeper, right? Um, there is a really, really good article about, you know, why, why do anxious people feel relaxed? Going back to circling right back to where we said in the beginning. Um, Abby Moss has a great article, um, why some anxious people find comfort in horror movies. One of her great best quotes I found, uh, knowing you can get through something frightening, even if it was entirely fictional can be oddly soothing. And again, exactly. It's like, you it's said, a controlled environment. Yep. Yep. So you get to feel that sense of catharsis, that release, like you said, because it's not real. So you get to excite that fear while having it validated that, hey, I had a valid reason to feel this way, but I know I'm safe so I can come down from it. Or as my fear of roller coasters is entirely justified. Listen, I feel you, man. I used to like roller coasters <laughs> uh, and now I don't. So <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have um, oh, Ocean Gate make a roller coaster next. Oh no. Too soon? <laughs> Too soon? Too soon. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> um, just to give you some fun facts in science, right? Although this is a little outdated, but the theory is still used. It's called um excitation transference theory. And it's by oh. Stanley Satcher and Jerome okay. Singer, circa nineteen sixty two. Some big science verbiage, it means the experience of emotions depends on the subconscious arousal and our interpretation of that arousal. So broken down, you know, you get a sense of catharsis again uh, from that horror film or slasher movie that allows your emotional experience by proxy. Hmm. Basically everything that we've been saying. Hmm. But science says that's why. Um, so, go, uh, go ahead. Really? 
<laughs> my cat scared my bird. Love it. Uh, I think um, when we're talking about how this can horror can kind of like soothe anxieties, let's see. Let's think of examples of childhood anxieties. So we were talking about before how there's been this rise in video games uh, solely focused on childhood aspects from the 90s. Uh, so it's kind of aimed at us millennials, but it has attracted a wide audience of people of all ages. So of course I'm talking about like Five Nights at Freddy's and uh, I know there's a couple other games that are along those same lines. And so obviously Five Nights at Freddy's is based on Chuck E. Cheese, right? It's some way that we all grew up going to and it was a both a fun and horrifying experience because of the animatronics absolutely fascinating but of course for children seeing something that is not alive that is moving blinking and talking and coming at you larger than life absolutely horrifying as it's um and then there was like a murder case at one Chuck E. cheese but obviously like the game's not based on that it's kind of like the larger like these were robots robots can't hurt you right like what would have happened if Chuck E. cheese had gone a whole different way right it's not and safe. Then, it's never safe <laughs> and then you know and then it stopped being popular so like what happens to all those robots it makes it even more horrifying and fascinating it you does. know it does it's it's a whole bizarre world and you know childhood anxiety is not going down it's on the rise even more so from our generations yay so, every generation has its uh own uh shared generational traumas like for this generation these kids right now is covid so, does that mean in the future, zombie movies are going to be popular again? I think zombie movies will always be popular. That's never going out of style. <laughs> They're not popular right now. They still are. I mean, I guess they have their ebb and flows, but they're they're a classic. They're never going to go anywhere. Yeah, but you haven't seen any great ones lately because people uh, don't really know how to be creative about, oh, I'm going to eat you. Shoot the zombie. Ta-da! I think The Walking Dead took that for a while. There was a couple of other big zombie movies that came out, but... I mean, there's been incredible zombie movies, like yeah. Dawn of the Dead, you know, and Shaun of the Dead. Very and they true. were very political films, and, you know, break um, The Walking Dead. And obviously the whole point of those movies is what happens when society collapses mm -hmm. and there are no rules from which to live by, because obviously police and jails <laughs> exist. Because if somebody breaks the rules of society, then they must be taken out of society. You know, like murder. We can't allow somebody that murders somebody to be walking among us. So a couple more wrap. science mm -hmm. facts, right? Um, mm -hmm. There are some treatments that have been mentioned. So kind of what we're doing to ourselves by mm -hmm. going through this catharsis with horror films is has also like a science name in uh, psychology where they actually treat people, but it seems like we're just kind of doing this ourselves. So mm -hmm. fun facts. Um, there is some unintended therapy that occurs. It's chronic exposure or CBT cognitive behavioral therapy. That is the more technical term. So to give some background on that, um, Dr. Catherine Boger, uh, she did a Ted talk as well, where she explains that there was a teenager that had chronic anxiety and fear of vomit uh, because she was at a restaurant once where somebody vomited and then she ended up getting sick the next day anyway so it, it was crippling anxiety um, so what they had to do they had to take a more aggressive approach rather than like just showing pictures of vomit they had to actually you know replicate vomit get her to smell weird smells that was like vomit they would have to touch things and i was like wow that's a step too far but they they had to push her because little bit by little bit that exposure got her more it did not get rid of her anxiety but it made it manageable and i think that's what 
we do with horror films is that we expose ourselves more and more, numbing ourselves a little bit more and more, at least to the point where we can handle our anxieties for life. That is a really good point. Huh. Another fun fact of some more studies is done by uh, Dr. Maria Ironside. Very awesome Mm -hmm. last name, by the way. Um, She's currently conducting some research into the human brain by introducing some um, non-lethal stimulation to the frontal lobe uh, in hopes of finding and curing some symptoms of massive depression. So horror movies are are, uh, are recommended by psychologists. Two (laughs) thumbs up. Four out of five psychologists recommend this horror film. It's more like people ended up figuring a way to take care of themselves without going to therapy. (laughs) Healthcare. Am I right? (laughs) But it is not a replacement for therapy, okay? No, no, no. Need to go to therapy. Yes. And then lastly, uh, a fun fact. Uh, Colton and John, both doctors, mentioned in an article that uh, they found horror movie and slasher fanatics and enthusiasts uh, showed greater mental strength during the pandemic because it made sense. Everything that they feared, it finally made sense. (laughs) Yep. Yep. And we're not conspiracy nuts. No. We literally, like, we're not, like, holed up and waiting for the zombie apocalypse. We were just, like, sitting on our couch like we always do. And then the pandemic happened. And we're like, huh. And then continue sitting on our couch like we always do. (laughs) While everyone else was panicking and mass biling uh, toilet paper. Um, And so I think it's about time to wrap this up. So... The big takeaway from today's episode. So you mentioned as like, I really love the part where people that are using horror films to try to uh, deal with some of their fears. So some of my fears are heights, roller coasters, and primates. So that means I need to watch, um, what is it? War- not War of the Worlds, Planet of the Apes. Yep. And I will admit, I have been avoiding that movie because I am terrified of primates. I never knew that. <laughs> Don't Whereas, forget needles. You're afraid of needles. Not anymore. No. But um, my friend, she, when she was little, she watched the movie Birds by Alfred, Alfred Hitchcock. Love that movie. And became deathly terrified of birds. Tell her it's exposure therapy. I mean, honestly, what was it? I was deathly scared of uh, it when I first saw it. And I never, my, my argument is that I never finished the movie, so I didn't get to see the ridiculous spider scene at the end. Um, but when I went back and I watched it again, I was like, you know, this still gives me the creeps, but I feel like this is more manageable now. I'm not deathly afraid of my shower drain. That's why our mission is to bring you the material and immaterial resources to help soothe some of your fears and grief. That's right. And hey, don't forget to follow along for every new episode every single Monday on all major podcast platforms, as well as on YouTube for video podcasting. If you enjoy listening to us today, then please hit that subscribe button. And also don't forget to hit that uh little notification bell you don't want to miss out on any new episodes if you have questions or want to pique your morbid curiosity then follow us along on our social medias on facebook instagram and tiktok you can even email us any questions stories or remarks at sweetprogressinc at gmail.com don't forget to follow along and get our merch at our merch shop at etsy delicate death until next time Stay alive. Stay alive.